This is Mother Teresa, of course. She won the Nobel Prize in 1979 for her work with afflicted patients all over the globe. How about this guy? Anyone ever, anyone recognize this guy? His name is Norman Borlaug, and he won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1970 for ending and averting global famine. This was uh, really the most pressing issue confronting humanity at the time. It was uh, sort of akin to the climate change of his era. Nobel Borlaug was a plant pathologist by training, um, and he accomplished this work through breeding. Uh, that's why he's relevant to our talk today. You see, um, after World War II, analysts thought uh, that by the 70s or 80s, the rate of the growth of human population would exceed the rate of agricultural production. That would lead to catastrophic starvation and human die-off. But Borlaug solved this problem by breeding improved grain, which increased yield by over 500%. And he thereby saved over 100 million lives, making him arguably the most important figure in human history. So why am I talking about Borlaug? Borlaug's fascinating to me because of a conversation I had recently with an investor. I told this investor that we intended to double the average per acre yield in cannabis in the next couple of years. And they couldn't believe that was possible. They were incredulous, frankly. And I understand the skepticism. It seems like every day now, we hear new biotech startups coming into the space, uh, pitching disruptive technologies which will um, you know, change the market and disrupt the whole uh, uh, agricultural production. We're hearing about molecular genomics. We're hearing about CRISPR. We're hearing about um, biosynthetic production of cannabinoids. And we all want better, faster, stronger plants. But what's the right path to get there? The key to successful investing in cannabis biotechnology is knowing which of these approaches are likely to be successful and which are mere fads. I'm here to say the, the successful breeders of the future will create elegant programs which combine both judicious science and artful breeding. My vision, based on 12 years of experience in the labs, the fields, the greenhouses, and the grow houses of California, is a little bit different. I've boiled down this vision to five points. Five rules for elegant breeding. They all combine artistic, intuitive concepts with organized, scientific concepts. And we're going to go over each individually. Rule number one, grow plants from seeds. Plant production systems are something I know a little bit about. We're hearing a lot lately, especially about tissue culture, which again is uh, something we have experience with. Darkheart opened the industry's first tissue culture lab back in 2014. And tissue culture is a great technology. Uh, it's space saving, it creates clean, high quality plants. Um, but the production system requires very long lead times and the costs are astronomical. Um, many will tell you tissue culture is used successfully in other agricultural crops, and they're right. It's used for things like bananas and um, other tropical plants, it typically as a means of last resort. Uh, the bananas that we grow are sterile. You can only grow them from tissue culture. Most production in cannabis is produced through clone. Uh, this is how we make most of our plants. It's really the core business of Dark Heart Nursery. And uh, these plants can be very high quality as well. Um, they're moderately fast to market um, and rel relatively low priced. Uh, but there's a very high disease pressure for these plants. And that makes it really hard to operate a clonal uh, system at scale over time. Where we're going, and where most of the industry will go, is to production based on seedlings. Seedlings are the highest quality, lowest cost production system. They're the cleanest plants, um, and they have very low disease pressure. They're super low cost. I mean, we're talking pennies here, not dollars. The problem with seeds is that there's not, a, there's not very much availability of stabilized varietals. So you get a lot of variation in the crop. 
That's a problem that can be readily addressed by breeding, um, and it's one that we intend to solve. We do think that there's a role for tissue culture in research and development. There's some advanced technologies, especially around phytosanitation, that are great for tissue culture, um, but we don't see it as a production system. Okay, rule number two. Include heritage breeders in your program. These are the guys that have been here for decades. At Dark Heart, we work with them day in and day out. They're farmers, right? They understand this plant better than anyone. They've been doing it longer than anyone. And through grit and intuition, they've created an amazing abundance of unique and interesting varietals that we consume in the market every day. Um, you know, they can seem... Uh, they can seem sort of low tech and amateur uh, from afar, but I have to tell you, in three years, I saw these guys take the average CBD content of varietals from one or two percent to 20 percent. It's amazing the work that they've done given limited resources. They're truly the industry's artists, and any great program in breeding will build upon rather than replace their work. Let's look at an analogy. This is the wild mustard plant. Humans have been breeding the wild mustard plant for perhaps tens of thousands of years. And that's looked like um, sort of creative, amateurish breeding programs, very intuitive, um, by farmers, right, across many, many generations. And they've, as a result, they've created these unique species, the broccoli, the cauliflower, the Brussels sprout, right? None of us would consider abandoning the broccoli. And neither should we consider abandoning the breeders that have taken this plant to where it is today. Successful breeding programs, again, will combine this intuitive artistic approach and supplement it with modern scientific approaches. This is a well-known concept amongst breeders, uh, but history is replete with examples of breeding programs that failed to acknowledge and incorporate this basic concept. We'll see some of those examples here in a second. Okay, rule number three, avoid tech fads. This is hard to do. Um, you know, we're, there's so much hype around these new technologies, right? And I'm as excited as anyone. We've got these molecular breeding tools that offer precision and so much power to the breeder. Um, we want to use them. But I caution you, don't give the nerds the keys to the kingdom. Just because you have a hammer doesn't mean the problem is a nail. The solutions we may be looking for might not be technological. And any technology out of context will fail. So in the 20s, there was a great new technology on the market uh, where breeders would apply x-ray technologies to seeds. This would induce mutations in the plant. Um, and the purveyors of this technology promised that it would create marvelous new varietals that were quote unquote made to order. Sound familiar? Um, at one point, you could actually take your seeds to like a local uh, drugstore or something like that, and they would have you, you could have them irradiated on site and take them back to your take them back to your garden and grow them. As interesting as that is, you might not be surprised to find out that this technology had virtually zero commercial applications. It was all hype, all science. And you could see some of the hype, um, but no art. There was no understanding of the crop. Sometimes the technology can distract a program um, but with fads, right? Other times, the program can implement good, strong techniques, but the goals themselves are um, misplaced. That brings us to rule number four. Consider consumers. It seems obvious, but it hasn't always been. How about the tomato? How do you guys like your grocery store tomatoes? Anyone? I, I hear some people liking them. <laughs> so, um, you know, the grocery store tomatoes, they look great, right? They're, they're, they're bright, they're firm, they're colorful, but they taste like garbage. I mean, they taste like water, right? 
And the reason is that since the 60s, tomato breeders have bred for everything but flavor, right? They've bred for mechanical harvesting, they've bred for um, firmness, they've bred for pest and disease. But like literally the consumer was not on the list of breeding targets for tomato programs. Uh, that breeding was scientific, but um, it didn't consider the consumer. It didn't consider the end result of the program. It focused on agronomic traits alone, and that led the program astray. You know, nowhere is this more of a problem than in cannabis, where flavor is king, right? It's what our consumers are really looking for. And this problem in tomatoes and, and other vegetable and fruit crops is an ongoing problem. Um, in response to it, breeders in recent decades have sought to apply um, molecular biotechnology tools uh, to correct it. It actually led to the introduction of the world's first GMO crop, which was created by a company called CalGene here in California. They called this crop the Flavor Saver Tomato. It was introduced in 1994, um, and it had a gene that extended shelf life of the tomato. So this allowed the tomato to ripen on the vine, which is the big problem with tomato flavor. So it's a tomato that ripens on the vine can be much sweeter uh, and have a much better flavor at market. Um, and it should have been a hit, right? It's the, only market on, it's the only tomato on the market that tastes great. But the company was led by scientists, right? They were eager to use this GMO technology. And they didn't include input from farmers and other, um, other people in the supply chain. As a result, they didn't really understand the supply chain or the economics of the commercial farming uh, industry. They didn't start with really great tasting varietals, and they didn't start with great yielding varietals. As a result, the flavor saver tasted better, but it didn't taste that much better, and it was really hard to produce. It was low yielding, it required special packaging to get it to market. The production costs were sky high, and consumers rebelled at high prices. The product was ultimately abandoned in 1997, and Calgene was sold at a discount to Monsanto that same year. It brings us to rule number five. Use an integrative approach. Most understand, you have to understand the context in which you're breeding. What are the targets and what impact will they have on the supply chain? Is breeding even the right way to address the problem? Not only do you need multidisciplinary scientists, but you also need stakeholders from across the supply chain. Imagine if Calgene had included farmers and processors and distributors in their breeding program. They may have identified some of these problems earlier on, and that would have allowed them to pivot the project. Molecular breeding technologies like the Flavor Saver are super exciting, but they have their limits. They allow really precise targeting of genetic changes. They're like, uh, they, you know, they allow precise control, sort of like a scalpel, right? And, and scalpels are really good, really important tools if you're doing surgery. But if you're building a house, a scalpel isn't of much use to you. Breeding is much more like construction than it is like surgery. So let's go back to Borlaug, right? What did he target uh, that won him a Nobel Peace Prize? Yield, right? Yield, average production of this plant. And really, that's what almost all breeding is about. We talk about it in different terms, pest resistance, drought resistance, other targets. But most of these are about yield. And the thing with yield is there's no gene for yield. There's no marker that can be identified for yield. Yield is a complex interaction of hundreds of genes and non-genetic factors like environment, production system, and others. Here's the proof. This is a graph of the average of the improvement of uh, corn yields over the last 150 years. Um, now, you might consider the slope, especially in the modern era since the 60s, to represent the impact of breeding on the crop. Um, and keep in mind, corn is the most important grain worldwide. The U.S. crop alone is worth $51 billion a year, 
which makes it the biggest target for research and development. No cost is spared on breeding corn. Um, every tool available is used on corn. Now, the thing that I like to point out here is you'll see my call out on the graph. Corn was, the corn genome was sequenced back in 2009. And we might expect that if modern molecular genomics were breakthrough technologies, that the slope of that, grow, uh, the slope of that graph would have went aggressively up. But as you can see, since 2009, corn breeding has stayed along the steady path that it was already on, suggesting that although this tool may have some uses, it's certainly not a breakthrough technology. So let's go back to Borlaug one more time, right? If it's not technological breakthroughs, what is it that, that makes a breeding program successful? What is it that made Borlaug successful? It's about elegant systems, right? How did Borlaug increase the average yield of wheat by 500%? He bred two crops a year. That's it. He bred two crops a year. That was his innovation. Borlaug was breeding here in the central highlands of Mexico in this town called Chapingo, right? And he realized that because of the difference in latitude, at the end of the breeding season, he could take his seed and move it north to the Yaqui Valley where he could get a second grain season in. This was called shuttle breeding. It was a clever innovation in the breeding system rather than a breakthrough technology. That clever innovation accelerated the improvement of, corn, of uh, grain yields and it saved 100 million lives. Borlaug's solution wasn't genius but it was elegant and unexpected. And that kind of elegance will drive successful breeding programs in cannabis. Successful programs in the future will combine judicious science, but they will include, the, the, they will include and accelerate the experienced, creative, intuitive, artistic breeding that's already here. They certainly won't replace it. All right, thank you. Take questions. Hi, Dan. I wanted to ask, because you've um, pointed out the heritage farmers and people who have been developing brands for uh, strains for many years, my question is, why aren't we seeing some of these heritage strains on the market in the, in the cannabis products? Maui, Wowie, you know, these type of brands that have been around for many, many years that were very uh, flavorful, very lovely um, strains that I don't see on the market anywhere. So uh, where are these? Boy, that's a really good question. Um, you know, it's interesting because there's actually a lot of demand in the market for some of those varietals. Um, I would say the biggest thing that I see is they're really hard to come by these days. Some of them have sort of just, um, I mean, that's the thing about cannabis coming out of this underground space is that uh, many of these programs just were lost over time. Um, so I think in many ways there's a demand out there for them, but it's just an issue of finding them and bringing them back to market. Okay, thank you, Dan. Right thank you very much. A round of applause.